Ken Stance's Improve Your Game, and is metagaming as bad as I say it is. Buckle up, kids. This is going to be a wild one. So, what the crap is a stance? A stance, in very generic terms, is how we, the players, determine what our imaginary characters are doing in the world, with motivations or otherwise. There are three and a half of these, and I didn't come up with them. I'm just the messenger. But having the terminology helps us have discussions about this. We're going to start with actor stance, since that's the one that most people are familiar with. In actor stance, your character can only act on their thoughts, perceptions, and knowledge. Nothing else, nothing outside. For instance, if you know that your buddies are being murdered three doors down in this dungeon, you can't act on that because your character doesn't know. And before we move on, let's talk about what actor stance isn't, mostly because I messed it up for a long time. It isn't the distinction between in character and out of character. It isn't using flowery language or speaking in accents or anything like that. It is specifically how we make decisions for our characters. Next up, we have author stance, which is one of my favorites. In author stance, we the players determine what our characters are going to do without having to look through the lens of what they know and what they don't know. In this case, if we need to, we can justify it after the fact, give them the motivation that they need to do that thing, but we don't have to. If we don't bother to justify the actions after the fact, then we're in pawn stance. That's our half stance. I like to think of pawn stance as sort of the RTS stance. And now we get to my actual favorite stance, director stance. Sorry, author stance. In director stance, you can change all kinds of things that may be well outside your character's ability to change. In director stance, you have a lot more control over the shared imaginary space. That's cool. Need some examples? Here's three, and I'm gonna consult my notes, so I'm not ignoring you or anything. I reach into my backpack and grab the torch placed for easy access. Chances are very good that the player did not prepare that carefully, and they're sort of making that up on the spot, but that's director stance. As I tumble off the crumbling precipice, I grab onto the edge to avoid certain doom. Again, you know, maybe we make a skill check for that, maybe we don't, but this is the character, sorry, this is the player, uh, saying something about the world. Why, all the people in my village have green hair. It sets a nice precedent, maybe a weird one, uh, and it's clearly not within the character's control. That's also director stance. I like director stance because I like making stuff up. It's a big part of why I'm a GM. The good news is, if you can share that burden with your players, uh, give them some of the authorial control, then they can help you make stuff up too. And all of us are more creative than one of us, believe me. And here we are, metagaming. The best definition I've heard so far is that metagaming is using player knowledge to make character decisions. Those of you that hail from actor stance traditions have undoubtedly run across this. If you played White Wolf in the 90s or a lot of D&D, um, those are the main perpetrators. The expectation within some of these traditions is that characters are played within very narrow roles, that they're played very rigidly. Lots of folks will tell you that this is the right way to roleplay. Want some examples? Sure. I'm going to consult my notes again. You know that the thief has pawned one of your favorite tchotchkes because the action was played aloud at the table. You look for a reason to look for the tchotchke and then jump to the conclusion that the thief took it so that you might confront them. Your wizard avoids the anti-magic cone of a beholder, even though the character has no reasonable idea what the creature is or what its abilities are. Part of your party is three doors down, being murdered by a wraith. You decide that your character wakes up in the middle of the night for no reason so that you might go and help them. All three of these are technically metagaming. I used to feel a lot more strongly about metagaming than I do today. I come from an actor stance tradition. If I had a nickel for every time a discussion about metagaming or argument about metagaming derail our actual game, I could publish my game. And you know how I feel about nickels. Personally, I would rather tell a more compelling tale than get caught up in a bunch of lawyering. By focusing on immersion, I think we're missing out on a lot of what can be good in RPGs. And you don't need to be in actor stance to get attached to your characters. We naturally move between stances on a regular basis, sometimes without realizing it. And I posit it's almost impossible to not do this. And when we do this with the best of intentions, it usually means our games are better. Here are a few examples of how I run this stuff, where I encourage my players to engage in author or director stance. For my game, I stole bonds from award-winning tabletop role-playing game Dungeon World. And it's okay, Adam gave me permission. A bond is how two player characters relate, and when they no longer relate that way, we resolve the bond and then both sides get a reward. We discuss them openly at the table and at the end of every session, and I give author stance examples to sell this. I encourage them to discuss the bonds with a player on the other end of the bond so that they can build drama. Need an example? All right, we'll use fake names on top of our fake names to protect the guilty. Jorath thinks Merrick is a stinking necromancer. When we discuss this as players, it gives us choices. 
We can play away from it because it's not what we want as players. Merrick might go to great pains to show the good side of magic rather than the darker. Or lean into it. Merrick's player might decide that it's way cooler if Merrick is a necromancer. Maybe he plays into it to increase his mystique. Or we can lean into it to give the wrong impression. Merrick's player might decide that it's way cooler if Jorath thinks Merrick is a necromancer, but he isn't. So it comes from made of this stuff. In my opinion, the game gets a lot more interesting when players conspire to spin a better tale. During play, I like to ask players to fill in some of the blanks. Sometimes these are characters like trainers, rivals, and supporters. Sometimes these are things that haven't been fully fleshed out in the world yet. I want to give my players more ownership, not less. While I can think of every NPC in the game in isolation, it's way more fun if I get to play someone they thought up. Some of my favorite NPCs have risen from this exercise, including the not-quite-sane orc pirate Orog Dustbin. Two years later, my players still tell stories about Captain Dustbin, and they get better with every retelling. Again, all of us are more creative than one of us. I didn't start with a fleshed out campaign world 30 years ago. I started with a bunch of scattered ideas, and dozens of players have helped me create it, filling in the blanks. Many races exist solely because players wanted a cool character. One of them, for instance, wanted to be his own best friend, hence the Dagarum, a now well-established canine race. I generally let my players define anything that isn't established or that I don't have strong opinions about. I still want it to fit in the world, it still needs to be consistent. But I default to yes and rather than no, like any good improviser. A player in my Saturday campaign is playing a fae. His character is terrified of eagles. I find this hilarious. I asked if eagles were a serious threat to his people. He said yes, and now it's not only an amusing recurring joke, but it's also canon. Next up, Critical Role taught me two things. First, dumb characters can be hilarious, although that really isn't pertinent to this discussion. Second, letting players describe the kill shot is awesome. Mercer typically only does this for bosses, but I like it enough to use it on the last kill for every encounter. This gives players a taste of director stance. Whereas I will sometimes embellish their description in fun and interesting ways, it's usually just a dramatic retelling. Last up, at the end of a campaign, assuming we get there, I want the players to tell me how their characters' stories end. Old PCs will sometimes become NPCs in future campaigns, and I want the players to have some narrative control over this as their last act of creation. At the end of my last campaign, I gave two of my players a choice. I knew that the place they came from would be destroyed, and that their mother and father would die in the defense of that place. I gave them the option. Do you go home and die with your mother and father in defense of your homeland, or do you go on adventuring and continue? One of the ways I explained this was, at some point in the unforeseeable future, a statue would be erected where their mother and father died. How many characters are in this statue? Is it two for the adoptive mother and father, and maybe one for the adoptive sister? Or is it five, including their player characters? This is one of the great strengths of our hobby that is hard to do in other types of gaming. Our players can leave real marks on the world that future players might see. If my players had decided that their characters died with their adoptive family, future players might see their likenesses in that statue and wonder who those people were. My game is full of these kinds of things. That's one of the great strengths of having a well-traveled campaign world. Hopefully this has been useful, or at least entertaining. For those of you who have never delved into author-director stance, it might be worth it to give them a shot, table willing, and see if they can help your game be a little bit more awesome. I'll drop some stuff in the doobly-doo if you want to know more. But that's plenty enough for one video. Shoo, I'll see you on Sunday.